Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast using the network architecture of expression quantitative lo trait loci to understand complex traits. I'm Bob Woodard of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I have a couple of important announcements. This webcast is, is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A window, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. You can increase the size of the, of the slides, enlarge the slides by clicking on the screen icon on the lower right-hand side of the slide window. If you experience problems during the event with audio or visual, please click on the support button at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. John Plattig. Dr. Plattig is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Plattig. I will now turn the presentation over to him. All right, well, thanks, Bob. So uh, today I'd like to talk about using the network architecture of EQTLs to understand complex traits. And if you caught John Quackenbush's talk earlier today, he alluded to it a little bit. And I think that this talk fits into sort of a larger body of work that the Quackenbush lab is uh, currently doing in trying to understand some of these big data questions by using uh, network techniques. And specifically, you know, one, one uh, challenge that we always run into is that we get a network and then now what? You know, you can, uh, you can make a hairball, um, but then trying to extract useful biological information out of that can be a challenge. So uh, hopefully I'll provide some, some ideas for that today, uh, specifically in the context of EQTLs. So I'd like to first acknowledge my collaborators, Peter Castaldi and Don DeMeo, who are both faculty at the uh, Harvard Medical School and um, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then of course, uh, my advisor, John Quackenbush. So uh, before I get too far ahead of myself and outline for the talk, um, I'll discuss a little bit some of the challenges from going uh, from GWAS to function, genome-wide association studies, uh, and then talk a little bit about calculating EQTLs. Uh, then finally, uh, our attempts at uh, modeling EQTLs as bipartite networks. And then finally, trying to go from network properties to biology, which, you know, as someone who's worked on gene regulatory networks before and coming from a network physics background, I think that's probably the most challenging aspect of some of these problems, which is what aspects of the network topology are actually most informative to the biology of the data that you're working with. And then finally, I'll discuss some future directions that we have for some of the CQTL analysis. So earlier this year, uh, there was a uh, paper that came out in Nature talking about uh, the body mass index and the, uh, the genetic contribution to that. And so this method, uh, or this uh, paper rather, used 339,000 individuals and their genotypes. And what I think is particularly illuminating is that the 97 loci that they found accounted for only 2.7% of the BMI variation. And the genome-wide estimates suggest that the common variation accounts for 20% of BMI variation. So you have lots of these loci, these, these SNPs, that all appear to have weak effects. And uh, there's another paper that came out in October of last year uh, looking at the genetic contribution and uh, genetic variation in human height. And, you know, in this, in this particular paper, they used a quarter million individuals, 253,000, and they were able to find 697 variants that were able to explain 20% of the phenotypic variants. But then to go uh, to 21%, they needed uh, 2,000 roughly SNPs. To get to 24% of the variants, you had to include uh, 3,700 SNPs. And then to get up to 29% of the phenotypic variants, you needed 9,500 SNPs. So clearly, uh, the SNPs that are associated with these, these phenotypes, these complex traits, uh, there's not just one that's driving uh, the complex trait. It, many of these are not strongly Mendelian, 
but rather you have this large group of SNPs that appear to be uh, at least associated with phenotypic variants. Uh, so, you know, in case you're not already familiar with uh, GWAS, genome-wide association studies aim to associate a genetic variant, usually a SNP, with a trait and typically uh, at a genome-wide significance level, meaning that the p-value has to be less than 10 to the minus 8. And uh, so this is from a paper in 2013, but uh, genome-wide association studies have uh, identified more than uh, 8,500 significant associations with more than 350 complex traits. And, uh, you know, the, these numbers are exploding uh, as, as more data becomes available. But the challenge with these methods is that you go from a single nucleotide polymorphism or a single variant uh, to a cell or tissue organ level uh, trait. And so how, does, how do you bridge this, this gap uh, functionally? Because 88% of the SNPs in the NHGRI GWAS catalog are intronic or energenic, so they're not directly affecting coding. And in fact, uh, there's a paper that came out from the GTEx consortium just last week that suggested uh, that number is more like 95% of SNPs. Um, so the, uh, the issue then is, you know, where is the function uh, when you want to uh, investigate this biologically? And so what people often do is, and in this uh, GTEx paper that came out last week, which I would highly recommend reading, uh, they took an expression approach. So instead of just looking at whether or not the SNP is associated with the complex trait, uh, you can do an association with a SNP and then a gene's expression level using gene expression and gene, uh, genotyping from a matched set of SNP samples. And so uh, typically what's done is uh, looking only at SNPs that are within a certain window of the transcriptional start site. Uh, so a common choice is uh, plus or minus one megabase um, around the transcriptional start site. And so then you take a particular SNP, you look at the gene expression for the gene, and then you can do some sort of usually a, a linear regression between uh, the allele frequ the frequency of the locus and the expression level. Uh, and so uh, one of the other reasons that um, that people focus on cis is that these effects are often easier to interpret biologically and they have strong effects. And so you're, uh, uh, for example, you're looking here at a figure from Trends in Genetics from Gilad et al. in 2008. And uh, the left panel here is showing uh, each blue dot is a SNP and it's positioned from the transcriptional start site of the HLAC gene and the y-axis is the minus log of the p-value for the association between the gene expression for HLAC and uh, the SNP presence, the SNP dosage. And so the red dot in the left panel, the one uh, with the log minus log p-value close uh, to 11 there, or 12, uh, you can see the genotype versus the expression in the right-hand panel for that. And so you can see that, you know, this is kind of a canonical example of an EQTL where um, the expression changes as a function of the genotype in a linear fashion. Uh, however, um, there have been a couple of papers in the last year, year and a half, uh, especially looking at this concept of trans EQTLs, which are those that are outside of this window of the transcriptional start site. And uh, there's some work suggesting that trans EQTLs are more cell type specific. They can be associated with uh, many genes. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, one example of a trans EQTL might be one where there's uh, the SNP is located in the promoter region of a gene that is a transcription factor, and it alters the expression of that transcription factor, and thus all of the downstream targets of that transcription factor are also affected. And so uh, there was a Nature Genetics paper that came out in October of last year uh, looking at uh, these trans EQTLs in two very large cohorts, where I think the first one was five, roughly 5,000 individuals or 5,000 samples, and the replication cohort was uh, on the order of 3,000. And they found that these trans EQTLs, many of them uh, were replicated. So there, there does seem to be, to be evidence that they exist. And uh, in addition, there was a, a paper that also came out um, recently um, from Carl Kingsford's group uh, showing that 
if you look at these trans EQTLs, which may uh, in the genomic sense be far away, they may actually physically be very close. And so if you, uh, this paper looked at uh, higher order chromatin domains using high C data and found that uh, there's actually a very sort of rich structure to EQTLs when you include the, uh, the proximity based on these high C domains. And so something that might seem far away genomically is actually physically very close. So there's a, uh, I think there's some good evidence to, to suggest that trans EQTLs are, are biologically relevant and interesting. Um, but one of the additional problems with these is the computational challenge. So for example, uh, for some of the data that I'll show later, um, if you have roughly a million and a half SNPs and, 20, and gene expression for 23,000 genes, that's a huge number of association tests if you wanna look at all possible SNP gene pairs. And in fact, um, you know, this would take roughly eight hours to run on one of the clusters here at Dana-Farber. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very, very intensive. Uh, however, there was a paper uh, that uh, also came out last year um, by uh, Andre Chabalon, and he provided this package in R called Matrix EQTL, uh, which is a, a very nifty way to do lots of EQTL analysis via large matrix operations. And uh, as uh, we use that for this project and found that it's actually a very easy to use and I'd highly recommend it. And uh, so this is a screen cap from his website. And um, you can see there's a, a little quote from a satisfied customer from King's College London saying that, you know, this just shortened my computing time from a year to a couple of days. Uh, and so this really opens up the, uh, the ease of, of calculating many, many EQTLs. Uh, but we think that, that this is a reasonable way to go as well, because what this is going to do is then produce many SNPs connected to many genes. And I think this speaks to our intuition about how genetic variants affect complex disease, which is that, you know, with the exception of the highly penetrant Mendelian diseases, uh, when we're thinking about complex disease, um, that especially ones that are age related or are late onset, you know, these things are the uh, are being influenced by many SNPs that are then, you know, potentially of weak effect, as in the case of the, the GWAS associations, you have thousands of SNPs that are then influencing genes or gene regulation and cell function. And so as uh, someone from a networks background, my intuition, uh, when I get data like this is to then try to treat all of these, uh, these EQTLs as a network of links between SNPs and genes. And specifically, uh, this naturally forms a bipartite network, which is just to say that your network has two classes of nodes. You have SNPs and genes, and you only ever have links that go between the two different classes of nodes. So you only ever have links between SNPs and genes. You don't have links between SNPs and SNPs or genes and genes. Uh, I will say that you could consider extending this work and uh, drawing links between the SNPs if you have epistatic interactions, for example, or if you wanted to put gene regulatory links um, between the genes, if one of your genes is a transcription factor, for example, and you want to include its targets. Uh, but that's not work that we'll consider here. Uh, so briefly, the, uh, the data set that we use to create this bipartite network uh, we got it from the Lung Genomics Research Consortium and the, uh, the website for that, you can see at the bottom of the slide here. And uh, this is a, uh, a collection of lung tissue um, from uh, samples uh, using it with COPD and also control. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and I'll discuss the disease on the next slide briefly here. But uh, you can see that we have a mix um, We'll need to, when we do the QTLs, correct for smoking as, as most of the, uh, the lung tissue came from individuals of a smoking history. And this gold stage you see on uh, the rightmost column is just a, a clinical marker of uh, disease severity. And it has to do with um, a marker of pulmonary function. And so you can see that we have uh, a broad spectrum of, of gold stages, as they're called. Uh, and so uh, COPD, as I mentioned, is uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And uh, it's 
Common subtypes, which are perhaps uh, better known, are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And uh, the disease uh, has a very strong environmental component, which is that cigarette smoke is the leading cause of COPD. Uh, however, you know, from a genetics perspective, the interesting part is that uh, you know, one estimate has it that only 25% of smokers who did not previously have COPD before smoking go on to get it. So not everyone who smokes gets COPD. Uh, so this is the data set that we're using. Uh, for the EQTL calculation, we used matrix EQTL. Uh, we controlled for age, sex, and pack years. Uh, we looked only at the genotype SNPs. We did not impute. And we excluded SNPs that had a minor allele frequency uh, less than 5%. And then after that, we used matrix EQTL to consider all possible SNP gene pairs. So uh, a sort of outline then of how we construct our network. We take a SNP and a gene, and then we perform the linear regression uh, using matrix EQTL. And then um, if the result of that test, uh, after doing all tests and doing an FDR correction uh, for cis and trans separately, but both holding them to an FDR of 10%, if the SNP and the gene have an association that is, then has an FDR less than 10%, we consider it to be a, a link in our network. So we draw a line between that SNP and that gene, and we do that for all of our genes and all of our SNPs. And then we wind up with, this network. And so uh, as sort of a, a first test of, of what the network properties looked like, we investigated the degree distribution. Uh, and so because this is a bipartite network, um, we actually have two degree distributions to consider. And if you're not familiar with some of the sort of network science parlance, uh, the degree is just the number of links that a node has. And so what you're looking at here is just the essentially the uh, normalized histogram or the frequency of uh, nodes that have a given degree. So for the SNP degree distribution, and uh, these are both plotted on, on log log axes, you can see that um, on the left hand side here for the SNP degree distribution, that the overwhelming majority of the SNPs are only connected to one gene. Uh, so that's the sort of upper left hand corner of, of this plot. Uh, However, you can see that there are a few, uh, there are a few genes that have uh, a decent number of connections. And so you can, I'm trying to use the pointer here, uh, in the sort of the right side of the plot, you can see there are a handful that are connected to many genes. And then um, we see a similar sort of, uh, sort of distribution for the genes. And so I, I should mention also that uh, this entire network includes uh, about 30,000 SNPs and 3,400 genes. Uh, so what we, uh, what we wanted to do next is ask whether or not this, these distributions were power law distributed. There's a lot of literature suggesting that uh, many networks in the real world, so sociological networks, technical networks, and biological networks have this so-called power law degree distribution. And uh, one of the reasons that people like to talk about it is because uh, these power law degree distributions, uh, networks that have those have these hubs. And so the idea is that if, uh, if a network has this kind of distribution, they're susceptible to a targeted attack of one of the hubs. So you could imagine that uh, if you removed one of these nodes that's connected to 20 or 30 or 40 different uh, genes that it would significantly impact negatively the connectivity of the network. And so uh, the, a popular um, example in technological networks is air transport. Uh, for example, here in the United States, if you were to uh, remove uh, O'Hare Airport in Chicago, you would significantly impact the success of air travel in the United States. Uh, so what we wanted to do is actually test whether or not so they, uh, these distributions were power law distributed. And oftentimes, if you just look at them, uh, and if you were to plot, for example, uh, this, a true power law distribution where the probability that a node has a degree of, um, has degree X goes like X to the minus alpha. Uh, if you were to plot that on top of this, you could get a fit that looks pretty good 
but because you're, you're in a log log space, small distances can actually be quite large. So uh, we used a method um, outlined in a paper uh, by Mark Newman, Aaron Clausette, and Cosmo Shalizi, which I'd highly recommend as well, which is called Power Law Distributions in Empirical Data. And they have a very principled way for trying to determine whether or not your distribution is power law distributed. And uh, so the advantage there is that you do the fit. So you, you take your empirical distribution and then you try to fit a power law to it. You estimate what the, uh, the exponent for the power law is and the minimum degree at which your power law activity begins. And then you do uh, a randomization where you generate, uh, in this case, 5,000 synthetic data sets that have those parameters. Then you try to fit a power law distribution on top of that and ask, how much better that fit is. And the advantage to this is that you can get a p-value for rejecting the power law hypothesis. So a p-value that says, you know, how confident am I that this distribution is not a power law? And so it turns out actually, despite looking very power law distributed, uh, it is not, uh, the SNP distribution is not power law distributed. Uh, the genes, so the, the uh, p-value here is, is almost zero, meaning that we're very confident we're fairly confident that we can reject the power law hypothesis. It's a little bit unclear for the gene distribution uh, since the p-value is hovering around 0.1. Uh, but regardless, there do seem to be these hubs in the network. And so what we wanted to know then was uh, where are the GWAS SNPs in terms of the degree? Are these the global hubs in the network? Are they the ones that seem to be most connected to all of these genes? And uh, it turns out that that is not the case. So uh, what you're looking at here is, is the gene degree distribution that I showed you before. Um, but the red dots here are the, is the distribution for the GWAS SNPs that we pulled in from the NHGRI GWAS catalog. And so uh, what you can see is that um, for each of these degrees, the, the GWAS SNPs do seem to be uh, more highly connected uh, for the low degrees, so there are fewer GWAS SNPs. Um, there's a lower fraction of GWAS SNPs, rather, that have degree one compared to the entire network. However, there's this sort of desert in the right side of the plot where all of our global network hubs, the EQT, the SNPs associated with many genes, those are not GWAS SNPs. Uh, so we found this uh, somewhat surprising, especially given the, the sort of global hub hypothesis in, in biology. However, uh, when we thought about it, we think it makes a lot of sense. And it, it brought back a remembrance of a story from, from World War II, um, where the British Air Force was trying to figure out, um, they had a limited amount of armor that they could put on their bombers, and they were trying to figure out the best place to do that. And so I'll give you a second and encourage you to try to think if you were handed this picture where you would want to put uh, the additional armor. And so uh, a statistician in Britain at the time was handed this, but uh, he was also handed this information, which were the bullet holes on all of the planes that returned back from bombing runs. And so he looked at the data and thought about it for a little while and realized that it was pretty obvious, which is that you should put the armor where the bullets are not, because those areas are, the, if you look at the picture here, you can see that it's the cockpit and the engines really where there are no bullet holes. And the reason for that is because those planes are not coming back. Uh, that a bullet hole to those areas is so damaging that the plane almost you know, does not come back from its mission. And we think that this is a good analogy for the GWAS SNPs in the context of our EQTL network. Uh, if there's a GWAS SNP that, if there's a SNP in general that is so deleterious that it's disrupting hundreds of genes, for example, then that's probably going to disrupt the cell sufficiently that it's not going to live long enough to, to divide and that it's going to die and we'll never observe it. And so we're, we've come to think of the GWAS SNPs as the sort of bullet holes in the, uh, the returning bombers. Uh, so if, if the, the global degree is not the most informative measure, uh, then we kind of took a step back and asked, well, you know, can we use this network to infer something useful about the function of these SNPs if they're, you know, if our, our easy hypothesis, which is that they're the global drivers, isn't true. And so what we wanted to hypothesize is that maybe it's the groups of SNPs 
that are affect, uh, affecting groups of genes to influence function. That it's really, you know, there's, there's not just one or two SNPs that are driving this as, you know, even though that might be easier to work with, uh, that's not really what's going on. It's more this many-to-many -many connection. And so uh, what we decided to do is we tried clustering the nodes in the bipartite network into communities based on the network structure. And so uh, this, there's a, a rich history uh, in, in statistical physics and network physics on community structure analysis. And communities are just groups of highly interconnected nodes. And so these community structure algorithms, what they try to do is put nodes together in a group such that the number of links within a community or a group is higher than expected by chance. And I'll go into that expected by chance bit here in a minute. Um, but it's sort of a, if I explain it, show you this picture, it kind of makes sense um, intuitively, which is that you have uh, this network in the lower right here, and these gray blobs represent the different communities. And so you want to make sure that you divide things up so that there are lots of links within the gray blobs and very few links going between them. And uh, formally, uh, what these community structure algorithms typically do is uh, they assign nodes to communities such that the modularity Q is maximized. And so uh, the modularity is just a sum over all of the communities where you take the fraction of network links in community I and subtract that from the fraction of links that you would expect by chance. And that uh, expected by chance uses the degree distribution of the network that you have. Uh, one of the other advantages to these community structure methods is that unlike some clustering algorithms, you do not have to give it the number of clusters a priori. So that is one of the things that it attempts to find. Um, and you can imagine that, that this might make sense in, in a biological context. You can imagine that there might be a group of pathways that are, have many links within the pathway, but they only have a few coming in or going out. And this is sort of our, our vision of what these communities might represent. So uh, one thing that we did have to modify, though, from the traditional community detection is that we, had a bi we have a bipartite network. And so um, we always expect that SNPs are never going to be connected to other SNPs and that genes are, all, are never going to be connected with other genes. And so uh, our bipartite community picture might look a little more like something in the middle of the slide here, where you have groups of SNPs that are the circles. They may have lots of links to the same set of genes, but not very many links to other sets of genes. And uh, so we need a different null model that accounts for that. And uh, I'll sort of go briefly through this slide since it's, it's somewhat mathematical, but uh, I would refer you to the paper um, by Michael Barber on community detection and bipartite networks, where this came from. And so really the idea here, uh, the key is uh, takeaway is that um, this uh, AIJ tilde here uh, is just a binary matrix where there's a one if SNP i is connected to gene J and zero otherwise. And so for genes that are in the, or for nodes that are in the same community together, you ask um, if the link between the SNP and the gene, uh, if that exists, how likely is that to have happened given the number of links that the SNP has and the number of links that the gene has. And uh, so you can do this and then there are uh, some good heuristics uh, since it's technically an MP hard problem uh, to, to maximize this modularity. So we went ahead and implemented that for our bipartite network. And uh, what we did then is uh, we found that um, we got a really strongly modular ne network. So the modularity value that we got out was uh, 0 0.77, uh, which is, you know, the modularity goes between zero and one. We got 35 communities. And so uh, a good uh, sort of visual representation of the, the community structure here is shown at the bottom where on the x-axis you have SNPs, on the y-axis you have genes, and what we, we've done is we've grouped all of the genes together that are in the same community, 
and we've grouped all of the SNPs together that are in the same community uh, as well. And then each dot in this figure represents a link. The colored links uh, are those that connect genes and SNPs that are in the same community. And then the black links, the sort of off diagonal links, if you will, um, are ones that connect genes and SNPs that are in different communities. And so you can see that most of the links in the network go between uh, genes and SNPs that are in the same community together. So you can sort of see that this idea of edge enrichment. Uh, and so we had 35 communities out, and this is just another way of looking at it. Uh, I call it a seashell plot. Um, but what we've done is we've grouped all of the nodes that are in the same community together and uh, those represent, those are the circles here. And so you can see again that there's a much higher density of links within these circles than there are that go between the circles. And uh, so this is all well and good, but uh, what we'd like to do then is ask what kind of biological enrichment do we see in these communities? Do, the, uh, do these communities reflect anything interesting? And so we did a, a standard Go enrichment and of the 35 communities that we found, uh, 13 are enriched for Go terms uh, with a p-value less than five times 10 to the minus four and a couple of other cutoffs for the overlap and whatnot. And uh, so just to kind of give you a flavor of, of some of the enrichment, we found one that was uh, associated with a microtubule organization, cell cycle and centrosome. And uh, in addition, we found uh, this community 30 which is enriched for immune response, stress response, and T-cell stimulation, which in the context of COPD makes sense as uh, one of the large features defining COPD is this chronic inflammation. And so there's a strong immune and inflammatory response uh, in the lung tissue, uh, which is where we, where we got our, our genotyping and gene expression. And then finally, uh, we, we have this community 18, which is uh, chromatin assembly, DNA conformation change, and nucleosome assembly. And this includes the uh, HIST-1A family uh, as well. So there does seem to be some, some very interesting uh, biology here, uh, which some makes, context, makes sense in the context of, uh, of our, our lung tissue. Um, but the other thing that we want to do and ultimately uh, um, address is linking SNPs to function. And since we have roughly 30,000 SNPs, uh, what we wanted to do is not just make a flat list of SNPs, which is, you know, we have these SNPs in this community and then, you know, try to do some sort of Fisher's exact test or hypergeometric. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to rank the SNPs in the communities by some sort of topology, network topology uh, that is relevant. So what we tried to do is, uh, what we did here is scored the SNPs by their modularity contribution. Uh, so, if you remember from a couple of slides back, uh, the modularity is really the sum of network enrichment, of link enrichments uh, over all of the communities. So, what we can do is back, uh, sort of back out and say, what is the modularity of community H? And that's given here, and so you're just subsetting the nodes that are in community H. And then, furthermore, you can ask, how much did node I contribute to the modularity of community H. And so we define this core score, as we call it, QIH, which is just the fraction of modularity that SNP I contributes to community H, of which it is a part. And so a, a sort of um, uh, hand waving or uh, intuitive argument is that if you look at this. Uh, this community structure on the left here with the red node and the blue node, you might say that the red node is much more central to community three because it has five links, all of which go to other nodes within community three. Whereas the blue node, which has three links to other nodes in community three also has a link going to community two. So uh, our intuition would be to say, well, clearly the red node is more central to uh, the community three structure. And that's really sort of the idea behind our core score. Um, however, uh, we, we still need to figure out whether or not these scores uh, correlate or reflect any sort of known biology. Uh, so what we did is we took uh, 
259 disease-associated SNPs from the NHGRIG WAS catalog. So we took all the NHGRIG WAS catalog SNPs and then asked which of those are also EQTLs in our network. And so we found 259 SNPs that were also uh, GWAS SNPs from the catalog. And then uh, what we want to do is ask what distribution of core scores do our GWAS SNPs have? And is that significantly larger than for the non-GWAS SNPs? So uh, we did this, uh, we tested this in, in two ways. One, we computed a, a, a KS test statistic where we asked whether or not the distribution of GWAS core scores was larger uh, than the non-GWAS uh, core scores. And then we did a permutation test where we shuffled the labels and we did this 100,000 times. And so the figure you're looking at here is just the distribution uh, in blue. It's the, the histogram of KS test scores for the random shuffling. And then the, the red dot here shows the true KS uh, test score for our GWAS SNPs versus the others. And then we also did a, a similar Wilcoxon test. And so you can see for both of them that the, uh, the p-value from these tests, the permutation p-value was, uh, is 10 to the minus five. And that's because we ran uh, 10 to the five tests. And so in addition to that, we looked at the median core score for our GWAS SNPs and asked uh, how much larger that is for the non-GWAS SNPs. And it turns out that the median core score for the GWAS SNPs is 1.7 times higher than the median for the non-GWAS SNPs. So they do seem to be more likely to be at the cores of these communities, the GWAS SNPs do. Uh, in addition, we, we sort of looked at the communities uh, of which these uh, GWAS SNPs were a part. And it turns out that 21 of the 35 communities in our network had at least one GWAS SNP. Um, and uh, we looked then a little bit at the function and we found that this community 31, for example, had GWAS SNPs for COPD biomarkers, smoking behavior, asthma. Uh, we also looked at community 30, which also had uh, GWAS SNPs for uh, COPD mark biomarkers, pulmonary function, interstitial lung disease, which is, um, is also a, a sort of inflammation lung disease. Uh, and I would remind you that so Community 30 also had uh, GoTerm enrichment for genes uh, associated with uh, T cell stimulation, inflammation, and so on. And then uh, Community 18 here was also had uh, GWAS SNPs for psoriasis, Crohn's disease, and, and cytokine response. So we think that this, uh, this approach to uh, GWAS, which is to look at the, the expression and the genotyping, uh, do the EQTL analysis, and then ask, you know, instead of just restricting our list so that we can make sense of you know, the top 10 EQTLs, rather we want to embrace the complexity of this data and allow, uh, allow it to sort of reflect the pattern of connectivity. Uh, so a couple of conclu conclusions. Um, we think that bipartite networks are a flexible way to handle large numbers of EQTLs. And as the, uh, the GTEx program consortium continues to grow and ramp up, uh, and as the availability of whole genome sequencing and uh, RNA-seq as those prices continue to fall, which John talked about a little bit, the falling prices of some of these assays. As those become readily available, we think the number of EQTLs that are going to be uh, available to detect and, and compute is going to grow. And I think this is a, a nice method to incorporate all of those and uh, to allow this sort of agglomeration of weak signals um, that points to biological function. Uh, we also found that community clustering can highlight groups of biological elements uh, that are working together. Uh, which we showed from the, the Go enrichment and also in, in the GWAS function. And then uh, surprisingly, we found that the GWAS SNPs are local but not global EQTL hubs and that they often lie at the cores of these communities. And uh, so some future work, uh, we're thinking about integrating epigenetic information, for example, layering on uh, encode data from the relevant cell lines. Um, there's been some work showing that looking at DNA uh, hypersensitivity can really inform some of the EQTLs. Uh, in addition, we're interested in looking at the effects of methylation 
on some of these EQTLs, particularly in the context of COPD, which is, has a you know, strong impact from smoking, which can affect methylation. Uh, and then we're also interested in replicating these EQTLs in another lung data set, uh, and also comparing uh, the healthy networks with our disease networks. And I think that's another one of the, the advantages of computing these core scores is that it then allows for distributions to be compared against each other. So you can ask, you know, which are the most significant SNPs in the disease network based on the core scores, and then compare that with the uh, healthy EQTL network from lung and ask whether or not those, uh, those SNPs prioritized by the core scores in the disease case are also prioritized in the healthy case or if, if it seems to be differential between them. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Pete Castaldi, Don DeMeo, Michael Cho, Craig Hirsch, Ed Silverman, all of whom are at Brigham and Women's and the Harvard Medical School, and then uh, some of the other folks in the Quackenbush Lab, Marie Kakuyer, uh, Kimberly Glass, and Albert Young. And so thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, and, and also my email is in the bottom here, uh, jplatic at jimmy.harvard.edu. So thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Plantig, for that very informative presentation. Before we start the Q&A session, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions in the Q&A box that you'll find by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left-hand corner of the presentation window. We'll try to answer all the questions we can, and uh, we'll wait a minute to see if anybody has any, any questions at this point. In the meantime, I'd like to remind everybody that this presentation will be available uh, for replay um, for six months after the day of this, of this live presentation. And um, we have a question here. This is from Anna Stittrich from the Institute for Systems Biology. Do the EQTL hub SNPs tend to have lower allele frequency? From the bullet hole analogy, wouldn't one expect strong negative selection on these SNPs? Uh, so yes, I, th I think that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, I agree that that I think you you would expect uh, strong negative selection on the SNPs that are significantly affecting uh, gene expression in a way that is that is altering um, that is altering the function of the cell. So I think you know, in the context of these hubs, uh, we're still trying to investigate, you know, what exactly that is, whether or not it's, it's a function of statistical association, uh, or it, maybe it's just some sort of uh, kind of neutral evolution that it's, it's not deleterious and so it's not swept away. It may not be functional, even though it's associated. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, once again, I'd like to remind everyone that look for an email from Lab Roots, reminding you when this broadcast will be available for replay. And we invite you to uh, forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Once again, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>